Hello, and welcome to Mentor Dino. I'm your host, Caitlin Rossier. I am an architect and founder of Mentor Dino. I firmly believe that architecture, engineering, and construction professionals can achieve true success by embracing human skills as their guiding principle. So each week, I interview amazing professionals in and around the AEC industry as a way to share stories, inspiration, and advice for others finding their own unique career path. Thank you to all of our current subscribers, and if you're new, we'd love to have you join our community. So if you like this episode, please do me a favor and hit subscribe, like, or leave a comment below. It really helps others be able to discover this resource and support them on their own career journey. So let's dive in. I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to the Mentor Dino podcast. I would like to welcome Jesse Robinson Evans, construction estimator at Rycon Construction in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Jesse, for taking the time to speak with me today. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So I always like starting out with my loaded question. And do you mind introducing yourself, letting my listeners know about your experience and journey so far with your education and career? Yeah, sure. I um, I always like to attribute playing with Legos as a kid to why I got interested in building and construction. Um, around middle school, I was pretty much already set on civil engineering. And um, but by the time I hit high school, you know, I was doing honors math and honors science. I was on track to, you know, be a good applicant to engineering school. But um, I actually did half days at Parkway West Career and Technical Center for construction trades. You know, the first year in, you know, 10th grade, you do nine weeks of carpentry, electrical, HVAC and masonry. And then after that intro year, you pick. And I, I, I chose masonry again because of the Legos or whatever. But um, again, the hands on aspect of it, it, you know, wanting to build things and just telling my guidance counselors and parents like, hey, hey, this place is actually going to teach me how to build things. Um, I did meet a lot of resistance to that because there was so much pressure to, you know, I, I graduated from Mount Lebanon High School. There was a ton of pressure to go to college. And I was just like, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to do my own thing. I I. I'll handle it. You know, I'll, I'll take care of business. But um, I did eventually choose to go to Pitt Engineering School. You know, I applied to their main campus, got in. Um, again, you learn a whole lot there, how to treat wastewater, you know, structural design, concrete design, uh, just geotechnical, all of which gives you a good context of understanding the built environment. But uh, I mean, I took one class on construction management. So after I graduated, it was sort of just, I was applying to everywhere. And it just so happened that a general contractor reached out to me first to interview. Um, so my first job out of school was uh, with, with a local union general contractor. And I worked on an advanced engineering building at WVU, had a clean room, you know, and I'm, I'm just out of school. I don't know anything about anything. I had to ask somebody, hey, what does RFI stand for? Um, but, you know, you build that experience, you, you ask your questions and you, you get a handle on things. Um, th- the next two years of my life after that was Skyview Apartments in in the heart of Oakland. And that was out of the ground, caissons, grade beams, shoring wall, uh, skies, you know, high rise steel and precast plank construction. I mean, I, I learned so much on that job and it was an absolute mess, but I, it, I got my teeth cut on that one and learned a lot. And the people I was interacting with thought I had been in the industry longer than I actually had because I was just not afraid to open up the drawings and be like, okay, where's that detail? All right, let's just, let's just figure this out. Um, I eventually changed employers to a non-union general contractor, and there I got my first taste of project management. And um, I I was doing okay with the assistant project management role, but as a PM of my own job, it was a little too combative. Um, It was a lot more responsibility, a lot more stress. And I really liked being a PE, so it, it was 
at the uh, non-union general contractor that I switched to the estimating department because my boss recognized that I was really miserable. I was sitting in a cost report meeting. He was just like, dude, are you okay? And I was like, no, dude, this sucks. So yeah, he asked like, do you want to go to the estimating department? I was like, yes, absolutely. Um, so that's how I kind of got into the estimating side of things. And, and it's good to experience both, but I definitely think my skills are better suited as an estimator. And then, um, Again, I start learning about assemblies and estimating databases and, you know, this is how you take off this and this is how a bid works. Um, this is what sub coverage is, you know, dead low numbers, like all, all of these things, you know, I'm, I'm learning very quickly. And then a couple of years ago, I moved to my current employer, Rikon Construction. I spent about a year in their building group department doing major, you know, airports, hospitals, um, water parks. That, that was a really fun one to do. Um, but now currently I'm in the special projects department where, uh, it's, it's lower dollar value, but more, more jobs. So instead of bidding one a month, we're bidding one or two a week. Um, instead of $50 million, they're, you know, half a million, 2 million, 5 million, you know, just fewer zeros, but the same amount of work basically. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the spark notes version of how I got here. Yeah, I already have a thousand questions on just that. Sure. Um, I know I understand that Mount Lebanon pressure. I went to North Allegheny. So for mm -hmm. any of our Pittsburgh friends listening, um, they're kind of the bigger one of bigger schools in the area and have very high, high expectations for their students. And that yeah. that may also be on the parent side, too, that I had that pressure of you mm -hmm. better go to college or you're a failure type mentality yep. to it. I, I think there's a aspect that our, our generation experienced that by and large, but again, in a, in a more intensified fashion in these, you know, Mount Lebanon is a very well resourced yeah. school district. There's a lot of money there. So just, just the notion that like, what you're going to go into the trades, you're going to go be a brick Mason is, it, it, you know, they want they don't want to allow that they they want to steer people towards college but i eventually got there but yeah i got a lot of experience you know my classmates were laying brick just like i was you know there's skill and dexterity and planning involved and uh, you know maybe while i was at tech school i raised my hand too much and blurted out <laughs> answers way too often the teacher was like dude i know that you know this you gotta let other people know it too and i was like all right, all right. maybe that that was sort of why i was like yeah maybe i should, probably still should go to engineering school <laughs> yeah but bricklaying's fun i did that at the most recent mm -hmm. build pittsburgh event and i had a blast so it's mm -hmm. fun um yep do you how do you think that experience affected how you are today um i i feel like the combination of b going through you know the hands-on trades education uh, I, I mean there, there's at the end of all of this the drawings the estimate the the cost report the schedule there's a human being at the end of that with their hands on a piece of material putting it in place I, I mean there's a lot of technology that improves productivity but at the end of the day I mean each building is too unique it, you can't build a building in a factory you have to actually go to the address and put the material there. So, I mean, I mean, that sort of hands-on aspect, I think helped. Um, again, as a project, as a young project engineer, uh, being in the field, I reported to the job trailer. I was in Skyview apartments while it was being built. Um, you watch the thing get built, put together. And, and I find that there's a lot of satisfaction in that. Just like visually, it's like, Oh, like a month goes by and, now this part of the building is up and then another month goes by and then you see it like get closer and closer to being finished. But um, it, it's really important to build a model of the building in your mind, having the spatial skills and being able to imagine it get put together when you're estimating, when you're looking at these drawings, you have to imagine there's a person here screwing this stud to this, you know this other stud how does they how do they fit the drill there yeah you know those sorts of questions really help 
cover more risk whenever you're putting an estimate together. Yeah, the drill example is what I always give my young architects when they're doing details. It's, it's like, hey, how big's a drill? And if they don't know, I go send them to like Home Depot to go measure it. So then I'm like, remember yeah. that dimension and then make it a bigger drill for safety measures and make sure you can actually put this thing together. Yeah, it's interesting how we both arrived of, arrived at that independently because it, it's – it was – whether it's a steel detail and weld or if it's, um, y y you know, studs and drills, it's how does this actually get put together? You know, how do you actually lay that block there when you're up against an existing building and you can't strike up the joints? How do you waterproof that? How do you, it, you know, it's, it can get as complicated as you can imagine it. Yeah. And you also mentioned having a combative experience on the job site. How do you find the the work architects and contractors are always joked upon of being combative and i have had a combative mm -hmm. experience and can see that hell but i've also seen the great ease when the contractor and the architect can work well together yeah i i want to i want to preface that you know my experience may be um colored by the client my employer at the time and you know maybe some of my my own inexperience you know a, a lot of things in the construction industry is just sink or swim and at that point i was sinking and not swimming and it was a combination of the the client was not well versed in construction she was a, a, a small time landlord improving her parcel she she didn't get it it, it, you know, we had framed a whole, we had framed the whole floor. She walked in and, and was like, you know, can you make this room a little bit bigger? It seems small. And it's like, you want me to, to demolish everything I just did, reframe it, the schedule impact and the change order I'm going to send you is going to knock your socks off. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I can't make the room bigger. I did what's on the plans. That's what's in my contract. Um, I, again, so there was some adversarial aspects there, just, you know, fighting over money, fighting over changes. Um, I had to fight the city, you know, one inspector says, Oh, put ACT here and that will give you access to your air handler. And then a different inspector down the road says, Oh, that's not good. You got to rip it all out. And it's just, it's just never ending. And some yep. people thrive on that. Some people love that. I, I didn't per personally. So I, you know. The rest, the rest is history is why I, as to why I moved to estimating because I, I find estimating to be more cooperative. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm helping a sub make sure they don't miss anything. You know, I'm trying to get everybody to be clear on the scope so they can give me the most competitive number. You know, I'm it, it's it's so much friendlier and I'm sure there's project managers out there that can get through jobs in a friendly, cooperative way. And, that, and that's fantastic. But at, at the time, the way I was the way I was working, the environment was I, I was in just was not cooperative and it, 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 it irritated me. It, it got to me. Yeah. But I think it's finding what works for you is important too. Like, all right, mm -hmm. that's not working for you. Do some about it. Yep. And, and the other thing I, w I wanted to say, the, the difference between operations and estimating was I, I really enjoyed being a project engineer because it was so much about what's on the drawings. The information is there. You have to find it. And if you can't find it, you can write an RFI and the submittals, making sure everything is, you, you know, getting put in place correctly. A lot of those skills make a lot of sense in the estimating side too. So my enjoyment of project engineering is also why I enjoy estimating, but the, the additional responsibility and um, adversarial nature of project management kind of pushed me away from that track mm -hmm. so it, it was great that i was able to switch and that my employer facilitated that yeah because i've learned a little bit about the construction tracks understanding like the project engineer project manager is one track and then that the mm -hmm. superintendent track more comes from the trades on that uh, side uh, uh, yeah uh, around here it's mostly union carpenters mm -hmm. who are superintendents but uh, yeah i mean the day-to-day Oh, a delivery showed up. Where are you going to put it? I mean, that that's what the superintendent's there yeah. to, to handle. Um, this sub, uh, you know, 
electrician, you're over in these rooms today. Framer, you get out ahead over here. Just just that basic day to day coordination is, um, you, you know, kind of within the realm mostly of the superintendent. But the PE supports that. You know, mm-hmm. make sure the RFI and the smittles are out ahead. So by the time you're building the thing, you're not asking questions. If you're writing an RFI when the sub arrives to do that work, you are already, you know, you already made the mistake. You're you're already behind. Yeah. So. Now, what's the where would you find like the estimators side like you and your counterparts? Where are you guys coming from? What type of skills or tracks lead into estimating? Um, I, I mean, I, I have my civil engineering degree from Pitt. I, I feel like a lot of other people get an engineering degree, get into the contracting world, and then get shuffled between PE, estimator, APM. And then uh, there is some cross-pollination there, but I mean, some people just have business degrees. Uh, quite <laughs> candidly, if you're good enough at Excel – and, you know, you have to learn how to read drawings. Everybody has to learn how to read drawings to be in this industry. If you learn how to read documents on the job and are good at Excel, you could probably be an estimator out of high school. Like if you're if you're smart, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I learned all this stuff in civil engineering school and just don't really use that much of it. Mm-hmm. Um. But again, it's good to it's good to have the background because you're talking to structural engineers that do use what you learn. Geotechnical reports. I mean, you do have to know what carbonaceous and soft soil and silty loam. You have to know what that stuff is to 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 truly understand it. But at the same time, whenever you're estimating a job, you look for is there rock or is there carbonaceous. Does the report say over X? I mean, you could really mm-hmm. simplify it down by the time it hits my desk. Yeah. Is there like simple things you look like when you get a drawing set and documents, where do you start? I, I start by doing two things. If I receive a bunch of individual sheets, I make a combined set. If I receive a combined set, I split them up into individual sheets. I I bookmark everything with the sheet number and the sheet title just to get myself organized and my head wrapped around. Cause, cause then you can, you know, you're looking at the drawing index and then looking at all your sheets and it's like, wait a second, there's sheets that are on the cover page that aren't in my set. Okay. now, Now I have to ask that question. Um, Beyond that, I, I kind of start with site work and then kind of I, I start at the highest division and then work my way down, I think, because starting with demo and concrete and masonry and steel, you know, two, four, three, mm-hmm. two, three, four, five. Um, I don't know. I, li- I like to get the biggest thing out of the way first. So like site work is sometimes a huge hassle and, and understanding that first might take some time. And then electrical is, you, you know, making sure. You understand the the service entrance, the switch gear, and then by the time you get to you know division ten and nine and eight, it's like this is easy. There's ten doors. Uh, there's a cup. There's a little vestibule storefront. Like that's easy compared to site work. That's mm-hmm. easier compared to the MEPs. Um, but I, I mean, the higher level view of like the estimating process is whenever I get, I get a job, you know. I get my arms around what it is. You get got to get the invite to bid out to the subs as soon as possible because no general contractor is going to survive without subcontractor input. It's just not how the world works. Um, getting that in front of them so they can start thinking and start deciding, are we bidding? Are we not bidding? Um, after that, some combination, depending on how I'm feeling that day, some combination of doing takeoff either for our own self-reform work or, you know, for budgetary purposes, you know, I'll, I'll take off, I'll count up light fixtures, I'll count up plumbing fixtures, um, take off the flooring, you know, take off the glass. I mean, there's no reason why I can't do that. It's just, I'm not going to self-reform it. I'm going to get a sub number for it. Um, then writing scope sheets. Um, every GC writes scope sheets. Some GCs don't send those out to the subs. Us at Rycon, we send them out. Um, just again, just to make sure everybody's bidding the same thing and everybody's on the same page. Um, once you get all your bids in 
or if you're not getting enough bids, you got to make some calls. There's no substitute for getting on the phone. And, you know, once the sub bids start coming in, making sure you're calling your calling your low guy, calling your high guy, making sure that they didn't include too much or they didn't miss anything, squaring everybody up. And then, you know, the day before or on bid day, you're putting it all together, buttoning it up, crossing your T's on your eyes and sending it off. Yeah. Do you make everybody's deadline like way ahead of bid day or how are you setting the deadlines? Like, do they know when your bids yeah, are due? I, I make the subs do 24 hours before it's due from me. And invariably, uh, you know, I'm still calling people, <laughs> you know, hours before the bid is due. I, it, sometimes it depends on the project. If it's a higher profile, you know, public bid, all these subs are waiting for their vendors mm -hmm. to send their quotes. So there, there's a layer even beyond the sub where it's the vendors hang on to the last second. So my subs hang on to the last second. So I'm getting a bid 10 minutes before it's due. And it's, it's, it might be the smoke and low number. And sometimes you have to just roll the dice on it. Sometimes you can squeeze in a call and make sure they're all good. But uh, again, uh, for the trades that, are able to i mean getting everything a day in advance you can at least get things close enough um you know your toilet accessories are done your door mm -hmm. vendors are good you know you know whatever numbers you can get in advance you know your own self-reform should be done in advance um so all that craziness all that hectic bid room activity in the couple hours leading up is focused only on those time sensitive things yeah I figured that would just be the like most hectic part I would find is the actual bid day. I had to collect. Oh, yeah. I had to collect bids once and I was like fresh out of school and everybody's checking my time clock and then uh, they go hide yeah. behind plants and stuff for their numbers. I'm like, this is just fun to watch. But yeah, like I, it, I tell my engineers like three days ahead of when it's due, knowing that they're going to mess up and they're going to have to redo things. So it's like I learned from that to like save my yeah. time. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, subcontractors are smart. They're they're privy to what we do. So mm -hmm. a lot of the times, you know, I'll make it do the day before. I won't get bids from the people I need bids from, and then I'm calling the day of, and and they're aware. They know. So yeah, it, you form that habit, and they can just kind of circumvent it. And now, now I have to make it two days. <laughs> now I have to make it two days before the bids do. Yeah. Um, Do you find the process any different if you are a CM on a job versus that standard design build? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm most accustomed to the hard bid world where it, it's the mentality is to get your number as low as possible. So you know, maybe you're excluding things, you're clarifying things, you're setting allowances for things. Um, and you know, if it's not on the drawings, you don't own it and you're approaching it from that get low mentality for, for the CM or the GMP side of things, you're kind of doing the opposite. Not, you're not trying to inflate your costs necessarily, but to, to best serve the client, they don't want to hear that you didn't include something. Mm -hmm. They want to just, just, just handle it, you know? So a lot of the time you're you're assuming more scope to make sure things are covered so whenever something is you know some scope is unclear or something isn't on the drawings you know you can be proactive and tell the client don't worry i'm a i do this all the time i'm i'm a professional i took care of it for you it's already in it's already in the number so so that to me that to me is kind of like the biggest mentality shift is you're only going to get a call back on a hard bid if, if you're low or if you're in the mix with a GMP, it's more about creating, you know, creating a comprehensive package that the client can rely on you to just cover any issues with. Yeah. And I've definitely used that GMP knowledge to work with my superintendent and my project engineers like, Hey, this was unforeseen. But we cut out this material over here. We didn't have to do this. I know we've got money in there. Can mm -hmm. we get this taken care of? So then it's us working together rather than having to go to the client all the time if it's within that same means. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, 
do you have can you tell when you get a set of documents if this is going to be a good set or a bad set right away um yeah everybody in the industry likes to complain about drawing quality and oh back in my day it was so much and i i I get it but you know we're all smart enough to still be successful and deliver projects on time and on budget with with what we receive i mean there's it's not like construction has stopped because quality the quality of drawings isn't where everybody wants it to be um the things that i personally look for is making sure things are coordinated between civil and structural and architectural um making sure the meps are coordinated you know if there's a if there's an rtu or a trash compactor or something that doesn't have a circuit i mean those are the sort of big ticket i look for the big ticket items that you know if it's not clear what i'm bidding on it's going to move the needle a lot it's going to change the number um that's usually what i look for um responsibility matrices if there's any owner furnished contractor installed or owner furnished owner installed materials i mean i i wish every job had a responsibility matrix because then it's it's in black and white Mm -hmm. i'm not not guessing um or excluding or setting allowances it's just it's in black and white you're giving it to me i'm installing it and and end of story um and the one other thing on the documents that I like to, I wish I could prove this. I wish I had (laughs) enough data to prove this, but a good set of documents gets me a good set of bids and gets the client a good competitive number. Whenever the drawings are unclear or there's missing specs or the scope is not well-defined, not only do I start seeing risk and start hedging that risk, so do all my subcontractors. And, and, and then the variance, you know, the spread on the sub bids I receive could be much, you know, much greater than if they're all, you know, right in line, right in competitive because they're all bidding the same thing and they know what they're bidding. So, so those, I mean, those are the things that I really look for in a set of documents is just making sure everybody knows what they're bidding and what's on the documents will actually work once you, once you build it. Um, I mean, I've, I've been up against a negotiated project where we're renovating some bathrooms and the, the, the control S the GMP estimate that I put together on these documents is just, uh, there's just so little information. I'm making so many assumptions and all my subs are guessing at what, what they're actually doing. And, you know, down the road, once we get into construction, the, there's not enough space for a toilet. Like it's a code violation. There's not enough like distance from the side or from the front and and those sorts of things. I'm, I'm pleased to say we got through that project well and everything worked out, but it's stuff like that can, that can really hurt a company or, or really hurt a client. If, if you don't approach it with, um, a problem solving mentality. Yeah. And, and you never know what you're going to hit, too. I know I've had that toilet issue yeah. on projects before, yeah. and it's just like, oh, based on as-built drawings I got, or I couldn't get access into a space yeah. to confirm it till we got a contractor on board to demo, and then you got a problem solve. But yeah, but the estimating side, I know I had, um, I've had a number of young professionals over the years when we get bids back or we're opening with the client to review bids. They're like, what do you even look for? And I'm like, well, the first thing I look at is let's look at the big number between everybody. Mm-hmm. And if everybody's pretty close, then mm-hmm. I'm at least first step really happy because that means I conveyed scope and my documents were at least clear in some manner Mm -hmm. even if i missed something at least it hopefully i missed it on everybody but when it's really wide ranging then it's like oh my gosh what's missing and what did Mm -hmm. i do wrong in the documents to understand kind of where the holes are between the bids to try to make it understandable Yeah, and it's tough for us on our side, too. Uh, If we lose a job because we included something that another GC didn't, 
you know, that that's a bummer for us too. <laughs> it's just everything can work out. You, you know, the low bidder can be correct and everybody can come walk away happy, but it's, it's in these situations where the, the scope isn't clear and there's miscommunication on uh, the analogy I like to use is, um, you know, we're just building a very complicated sandwich, you know, the, making sure the client knows what they want on their sandwich. You know, they don't want mayo, they want extra onions or, you know, pickle on the side, whatever. Uh, making sure that the client to the architect and then the architect to the documents and then the documents to the, the bidders, I, I mean, keeping that as clean and clear as possible is, is super important. Yeah. And then where does, like, your effort start and stop? Like, how does the pull in, we kind of talked about a little bit with, like, CM versus the hard bid, but, like, mm -hmm. where do you guys transition if you get a project? Do you stay on board to get people up to speed on the project? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is pretty typical of most general contractors, at least ones that I've worked for, is, you know, I, I send out estimates all the time. Maybe one in 10 I'll actually win. Whenever you actually win a job, then you get yourself prepared to transfer everything you know about the job to a project manager. Or so, some general contractors have a procurement department and, you know, they're in charge of buying out all the subcontracts. But it basically means, what did the client see? You know, show them that first, you know, whatever clarifications and exclusions I wrote. And then, you know, how did I get to the bid? You know, all the sub numbers, all the self-perform numbers, the general conditions, the permit, the profit, the everything. They get that sheet that tallies everything up. And then basically all of the backup, all the sub bids I received, um, you know, all the yeses and nos of all the scope items I wrote in my scope sheets. You know, it's, it, it sometimes ends up being 60 to 100 page packet or binder that I hand off to the project manager. We do a page turn. I tell them like, hey, they never answered this. I set an allowance. Be aware that we have to resolve this, you know, as, as soon as you feasibly can with the client to make sure they're getting what they want. Um, but yeah, that's basically the handoff process. And the, the only thing I can recommend on the estimating side is just saving every bid you receive electronically, just save it in a folder, make sure it's organized by division, by contractor. Um, again, a lot of the times in the chaos of bid day, you might be adjusting numbers here and there, pumping them up or cutting them. Make sure you have a clean place to play that game because a week later when you get notified that you won the job, you're going to look back and why did I subtract $10,000 from this number? Where did that come from? If you don't make a note of it or, or have it in an organized fashion, it just becomes, you just make your life a lot more difficult. Yeah. Moving way too fast in the last minute. Yep. Yep. Now do the subs know if their numbers in the bid on bid day, or is that, more told to them if you guys win the project that that is one of those informational asymmetries that you know is where a lot of general contractors provide their value i mean the subcontractors are out to every gc and you know they just want to be the low out of their competitors so if we don't get a job i i we'll share feedback with subs. I'll be like, you, you were third out of five bids. You're, you, you were about my highest bid. I don't, I don't mind sharing that information. Just like I would want a client to share that information with me. I want to know where my number landed compared to my competition. But if we have the notion that we are low or that we are receiving the job, sharing that information becomes a little bit more um, precarious because th that's an asset to the, the project manager or the procurement department. If they can say, oh man, all of these HVAC bids, they're right on top of each other. Can you help me out? You know, you can't do that if I'm like, oh yeah, you're the low guy. I carried you on bid day. Mm -hmm. You know, then, then they're not going to cut their number to get any buyout savings. So, I mean, I, I personally try not to 
mess with buyout savings. It's just you gave me your best number on bid day. Yeah, you did it. You know, you you won the game. Here you go. You just just get to work. You know, we have a job to finish. Um, we're already behind. But uh, again, that that's just something that's in the industry. Everybody does it. Everybody's aware of it. And and I've some subcontractors have told me, yeah, like I just put in extra money just so you can beat me down later. I mean, th- they're all aware of it. Yeah, um, they're not dumb. <laughs> so. It's sort of like a car dealership where it's like, oh, I have to pretend that I don't want to buy the car and walk out just so you can, you know, pretend to give me a better deal. I'd rather just walk in and you tell me what's the price, just yeah, straight up. But and then you that can might make be a decision. Personal preference of mine. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's a personal preference of mine. I, I try to be an open book and try and be honest in everything I do, but um, yeah, sometimes it does work that way. Yeah. Um, how was the bidding process during? covid and all the changes and material prices and spikes i know i had a yeah i had a call from a gc hey i need you to review this submittal for copper because i had shielded rooms and they're like you better review it today because price is going up this weekend and it's going to be a million dollar change order <laughs> and it's like jeez. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, i i had just started estimating i think in like 2019 mm-hmm. So I got a got comfortable with what I was doing. I was still learning, but I got pretty comfortable in 2019 and then 2020 hits and you know nobody really knows what's going on. Um I think there was an inkling of, you know, the lumber market was like, uh this pandemic's going to cause a recession and and we're not going to be building. So we're going to cut back wood production. Well, lo and behold, construction got deemed essential and everybody kept building. Like, I don't remember slowing down at all through the pandemic in terms of what we were bidding and what we were working on. So wood prices just go through the roof because there was just a disconnect there. But I I have this notion that, you know, everybody kind of has this notion that time is money. You know, you can pay extra money to save time. Like, yeah, sure. You can work overtime. You can make up some time that way. Sure. You can hire more people and put more people on the job to get finished sooner. Um, Oh yeah. You can pay to quick ship. You can pay to expedite COVID completely taught it. It taught everybody a valuable lesson in how these things are only semi exchangeable. Mm -hmm. Um, you, You can't, there's a limit to how much money you can exchange for time. There's a limit to how much money you can exchange for labor or for material. Um, again, I think we're, we're things have kind of stabilized, but certain items, I think like, you know, a big HVAC equipment generators, those things are still sometimes half a year to a year out. You can't pay to get it sooner. It's just not there. You, you know, the manufacturing facility that's producing these pieces of equipment still owes a hundred other people the piece of equipment in front of you. So I, I, again, I, I think prior to COVID, everybody was really kind of relying on square foot numbers are not changing that often. Mm-hmm. You know, you can use these rules of thumb and can rely on them and, Oh, you submit a bid. And then two months later, the client says, Hey, you know, your number's looking good. We're, you know, we have the permit ready to get started. Is your number still good? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Not anymore. In the heat of it, you know, you would submit a number on Friday. And if a client called you back next week, you'd be like, I have to go reach out to all my subs. I have no idea what they're going to tell me. Steel could have gone up for no reason. Mm -hmm. And you're just, it was really tough to get through. Um, I think there was a lot of creative ways around it to just, as soon as you get the contract, buy the material and warehouse it because that's cheaper than running the risk of it going up. Um, another thing is, I mean, I've seen some people look at the wood futures, like uh, like futures on wood or futures on steel to be like, OK, whenever this job is actually going to get built, these futures contracts are around here per board foot. So you build your estimate based on what you th- <laughs> what the market thinks the wood is going to cost when you have to buy time. it. <laughs> Absolute craziness. Absolute. I, I mean, it, 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 
we all had to step our game up because like, it was just a more challenging environment than the environment we were in prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Like I designed my friend's house in 2019 and he was building it in 2020 and he got hit oh, with no. 30% upcharge on wood. Yikes. Meanwhile, I got my oh, deck no. done right before all the price hike. And I was like, sorry. Yeah. But even like, like my husband was selling UPSs at the time of COVID and now he does switch gear mm. and just seeing mm. the lead time. Like if I've got a bigger project coming in on the design side that I don't even have a contractor for, I've gone over to him and be like, all right, what's your lead time right now on switch gear? I know that's only one manufacturer, but mm. so many more things are in that long lead time category. Now I, mm. I couldn't get all my card readers on a project. <laughs> like, I, Yeah. That that's the scary part is there's, there's just some odds and ends that for, for whatever reason, it's like, Oh, I didn't know. Mineral, mineral yeah. was a six month lead. <laughs> like what? It's insulation. What's the big deal? Or, um, Oh, there was, there was something else recently. I remember tapered insulation and TPO mm. at one point through the pandemic. It was like, you just can't get it. It's all gone. Uh, you know, it's a year out. And oh, what do you do? Um, but yeah, it, w it was just one of those things where everybody had to step their game up. You know, all of our scope sheet has lead times. I mean, we still submit hard bid with preliminary schedules that say, hey, um, you know, your schedule's not going to work. I mean, we're submitting the bid. Here's the number and here's the schedule. But, you know, the equipment is 20 weeks and you want to be done in 22. It's mm -hmm. just not sorry it's not gonna work out and then on the, on the cm side i mean if you do get in early with the design team and the client you know there's it's way more cooperative and easy to mitigate those things because it's everybody's aware and says hey if you need equipment if you need an rtu if you need a generator if you need this switch gear on this project let's design that first release us now you know we'll bid it out and release it early while we finish the rest of the design, you know, the walls and the carpet that that's not the problem. The, the 52 week lead time on a thousand amp MDP is the problem. Yeah. And if you can't get the building up and running and get it closed in and yeah, then it doesn't work. But a lot of the times mm -hmm. I'm seeing more of the multiple bid packages just to try to get ahead of it. But a lot of the times it's educating the owner if they do want that hard, design bid to like, Hey, we should probably bring on somebody early. Cause you guys know what are those weird things that are hard to find? Like on any of my other mm -hmm. projects, card readers and mineral wool have never been an issue. Thankfully mm -hmm. I was on a fit out project and didn't have much exterior work on it, but those aren't things that are top of mind for me. I'm used to the, okay. Air handling units, bigger electrical equipment, yeah. like yeah. the obvious ones. So yeah, everybody just has to have a heightened awareness because, again, the client, their time is money, too. If they need to be open renting out whatever or selling whatever they sell, uh, I mean, liquidated damages are a real thing that nobody wants to deal with. But understanding those risks is, you know, part of what we do here. Yeah. Do you have any advice for someone looking to go into the construction side? Regardless if it's estimating or not. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say there's there's plenty of need um, for, for for more people. The built environment isn't going to maintain itself. I mean, ev even through economic swings, you, hospitals still need renovated. Grocery stores still need built. Um, and, and again, it's it's nice that we're in a an era that you know, offices are getting renovated left and right. And, you, you know, there, there's a, still a lot going on, but I, I would say if you're going to get into construction, um, you, you got to be able to learn from your mistakes and, and learn from other people's mistakes because mistakes in our industry are expensive. So just do your best to have that wisdom and keep, keep, a running tally of, you know, never let this slide. If you make a mistake, you know, write it down to remind yourself to, to not do it again. Um, obviously I mentioned this earlier, reading drawings is really important. Getting good with the software 
tools available. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of Bluebeam. I, I think, you know, most construction companies use Bluebeam because it's a PDF viewer purpose built for construction. You know, it has a lot of nice tools for that. But reading drawings, you know, you can do it on paper, but understanding how what a detail is, what a section is, where where does it start and stop applying? Like understanding just the nomenclature, um, knowing to look for roller shades on the RCP, like all of these things you kind of just learn from experience. But I would say having the spatial skills to just envision the 3D model in your mind of what the building is. Um, being able to abstract from the drawings to that mental model. And then, yeah, just learning from your mistakes. Um, uh, w one good example I'll give you about le learning from mistakes is on Skyview Apartments, the, the architecture team and the developer were both out of Atlanta. They kind of knew each other, and they were building in our city of Pittsburgh where, you know, we were just the contractor. Architects are supposed to be a partial impartial third party when it comes to change orders and things like that but they definitely weren't so every they were they were issuing like 50 sheets were revised and they were calling it an asi an architect's supplemental information every single revision i would receive i would overlay it on my current conformed set and and there there was scope being added that nobody knew about until I was overlaying these drawings. It, it, and it, it hurt the company a lot that this wasn't better managed and, you know, somebody wasn't more on top of it. I mean, I was trying to be, I was, mm -hmm. you know, a year into my career doing my best to hold the place together. I mean, I wrote a thousand RFIs on that job. So trying to track all the changes and all the cost impacts was really difficult. So, Again, since I learned on that job that if you receive any amount of revisions, just overlay mm -hmm. it. Just, just, just make sure they didn't sneak anything in there. Make sure you understand what actually changed. Um, that, that's, yeah, that's sort of my my take on that. Yeah, that's always the hard part too. And it's like, then you're clouding it, making sure it's readable, and yeah. Well, again, in in the bidding process, I don't think anything gets clouded. No, I mean, I I don't know if that's yeah, that's not the standard. So so doubly so in estimating, they're not going to draw your attention to the changes. You you have to figure them out for yourself, which it can be time consuming, mm -hmm. but it's important to get your arms around it. Yeah, I'm trying. I do cloud with addendums, so it's more that initial bid. But if you're on board early between. DD and CD, I'm not clouding anything for you to know what was different if you priced out the DD package. Yeah. Yep. But then as soon as bidding's over, everything's wiped clean and you're free yeah. and go off that way. But Yep. I, but again, I, I was so it, it was such a mess on that one job that basically it's just my own personal rule. Like any revision I get, I just overlay it. It doesn't take me that long and it just everything jumps out at you, whether you're bidding, whether you're already under construction. And again, there, Bluebeam has an overlay tool. Yep. I think Procore also has a tool for yes. comparing. I think I've used Procore um, on it too, but I like Bluebeam's yep. a little bit better just so I can see the contrast because then I can change the colors with mm -hmm. it too. Yeah, it's it's it, you could take it even a step further. Um, I, di I did this for the water park that I bid on. I you can overlay the electrical, the mechanical, the plumbing, the pool equipment, and, and you know, p pick a different color for each one, and then you can click the layers on and off. And you know, is there circuits for all these pumps? Is there are there circuits for all of the? You know, just is everything gonna fit? You know, so I, I I really like that overlay tool too. Yeah, I try to at least always have a working drawing in my BIM model just so I have all that overlay because mm -hmm. we don't need to see yeah. it in every drawing, but. If I see another outlet yeah. on a glass wall or some, like <laughs> things in the middle of the space that I'm like, this is running into like 10,000 things or it hits furniture because nobody wants yeah. furniture on. And it's just like, yeah. no, I just want to see everything because then I can catch things a lot quicker than when you're kind of in your siloed sheet, which 
yeah. you need it to be readable for you, but that overlay can be just like eye opening. I don't. I don't even get to look at models. I mean, all I get is PDFs. Uh, and I just got to work with that, the contract documents. But it, it would be great to start getting models and walk around, zooming around in 3D, and yeah. I mean, maybe that would make my life easier in takeoff or scope. Yeah, at a minimum, if you could at least walk around, so then you could like look up. Like, I feel we'll get there yeah. at some point where you can just yeah. VR headset, walk around and just blurt <laughs> out like, hey, yep. this room, watch out. We got wood in the ceiling. We got this over here. This looks really janky. We should check the, what it, what's going on in the drawings. And any day now. <laughs> yeah. Um, have there been any organizations that have left an impact on your career? Um, I, I like going to the MBA events. I, I know a lot of the union contractors here in Pittsburgh participate, um, you know, MEPs and general contractors both. So, I mean, I really appreciate the MBA for what they do. Um, but if, if I'm being honest, th throughout my career, I think I was in the ASCE for a little bit, but didn't really get much out of it. Um, I definitely think unions in general, like in Pittsburgh, there's a decent union presence. I think they kind of increase the standard, you know, you know, the quality of the work and, you know, the wages. I think everybody benefits from having strong unions about, but again, I'm not unionized. Um, but yeah, I, I think even without being in any industry groups or any, you know, structured organizations, I mean, my own personal network, just the, the subcontractors that I know and have worked with and that are in my phone. And whenever I'm in a pinch, I can call them and they'll help me. I mean, kind of, kind of building your own network of just in each trade, in each division, have, have a couple best friends in that trade. So you have somebody to rely on when you encounter something new or you're not quite sure to how, how, how to approach a situation or, you know, in special projects, we bid things out of town and, you know, send traveling supers to, to these jobs. So even if it's a far flung area, I can call somebody that I know locally and be like, Hey, this area doesn't, you know, it's in the South. There's no union presence there, but like, what's a good number to plug here. Mm -hmm. and, and I've, you know, I call them and they're like, listen, if you, if you put, if you put this much in, I'll fly down there and do it. And it's like, <laughs> okay, I know I'm safe if I use that number. So that, yeah. that's sort of my take on that. I mean, it, it might just be me personally. I never really participated in extracurricular activities in high school. I was never really part of organized sports. I've always kind of just been doing your own thing. Me. Yeah. yeah. I'm just doing my own thing as me, but I still think it's important to have, you know, friends, friends in other places to talk to and work through things. Yeah. Like I like my connections with my reps I've made over the years. If I've mm -hmm. got a weird situation or something odd, I know I can call them up and if they don't know the answer, they can help me find it or connect me to a new person. I may not know to help me find mm -hmm. it. So yeah, of course. And the MBA events are always great. I know I, the big award ceremony, I took a, fresh out of school grad to it and it was like deer in headlights for and i'm like oh i probably should have taken <laughs> her to a smaller event first but yeah that one's great just throw them into that the deep great. end and it's fine yeah that's the way things <laughs> tend to go but yeah yeah have you ever way just to... underbid a project hmm i feel like that'd be my biggest fear is like not catching yeah. everything yeah, I mean, certainly every time you get notified that you want a project, that that Gut. that thought is in the back of your mind. It's like, OK, what did I miss to get low? Because especially in the hard bid world uh, where it usually goes to the low bidder, the better you do your job, the more things you think about and the more things you cover uh, and prepare for you know, you're adding costs, mm -hmm. you're adding hours and, you know, labor hours and costs to the job. So it almost behooves you to do a worse job <laughs> to get low. No, I'm, I'm completely <laughs> kidding about that. I mean, you want to put in good numbers. Um, I, I can't say that I've ever been on the receiving end where, you know, I was on, I put together an estimate that was stupid low and I've never had to pull a bid. I've never, uh, you, you know, the jobs that I have handed off, 
eventually, you, you know, shake out in the end to, to be successful. Um, I was just curious. That's just one of my fears. Yeah, like, if I was an estimator, yeah. I'd be like, oh, my God, okay. Yeah, no, it's... <laughs> You know, the fear, the fear is there and it keeps you diligent. You know, it forces you to make sure you don't make any mistakes. Um, there, there was an interesting situation that happened to me. There was a big development, two wood frame apartment buildings. And, you know, I'm, I'm the site work guy. So, you know, I, I take all this stuff off myself. I, you know, I'm aware of what's going on and we get, and this is a good teachable moment. Um, all the bids come in and there's somebody that I've never heard of before. They're from Ohio. So I can't get in touch with them. I call them multiple times, leave messages. They don't call me back. The clock is ticking. I, I just say, I write in my scope sheet. Does Jesse trust this number? No. I disqualified their bid. I'm not carrying their number. And then my, my superior, you know, makes the decision to, oh, there's the low number, like, Go with forget it. about yeah. this little note here. Yeah, roll with it. And lo and behold, <laughs> we get the call back from the client. They say, number looks great. Let's go. And there's this scramble where, you know, that contractor that I didn't want to use revises their number and is no longer low. I mean, they were they were in like the middle of the pack compared to the number that I wanted to carry. And it's just one of those things where it's like, man, listen to I my tried notes. To tell you. <laughs> I, 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 try, I tried to tell you and, and you didn't trust me. But again, sometimes sometimes you do roll with it. Sometimes you do roll with a risky low number. Sometimes you, maybe you put put a margin on them to cover any any issues but the the real fear that a lot of gcs feel i think and that is the where the low number is that i'm carrying versus where's my second bit mm -hmm. if this sub pulls their number they can pull their number as all day i'm still stuck with the bag so making sure and, and that's why having good competitive numbers is so much more comforting it's like oh if that person doesn't want to do it i can get that person for a, a extra percent yeah but if there's like a 20 percent 50 percent difference in the low number versus your second low that's when you really have to think like what's that how risk? much do i trust this <laughs> how much do i trust this sometimes it's the right number uh, there are i mean sometimes you find the right contractor for the job they need the work it's a complex job but they're good at that sort of complexity versus the other bidders um Maybe you get a contractor that's too small or too big, but if you get the contractor that's just right, it can be okay to use that number, but you just have to know what you're doing. You just have to be aware of what you're signing up for. Yeah. And building those relationships, just so if you know the people mm -hmm. giving you the numbers, if you know they're trustworthy, oh, you can call them up at any time. Absolutely. That's easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, a subcontractor that we've worked with over and over and over again and give a ton of work to, if they give me a smoke and low number, I'm like... Let's go. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I know you're not going to give it to the other GCs. Like, this is fantastic. And I know I can trust it. But yeah, like, there's, there's just so many different places where the risk can come from. And again, it's our job in the estimating department to make sure all your takeoff is done right, all your subcontractors scope out and have everything correct. And, you know, is there any special tax mm -hmm. business privilege tax or capital improvement taxes in this jurisdiction? I mean, there's so much to think about and so much that could get missed. It's, it's a lot to handle, but somehow we do yeah. it every day. <laughs> <laughs> and multiple every week since you're on the special yep. project side. Yep. But I like always wrapping up my podcast with this final question and it's what advice do you have for young professionals just starting their career? Um, I think I mentioned this already, um, but don't don't be afraid to ask questions. I think the general contracting industry at large has not as much training and mentorship as other industries might have. And if you don't ask, nobody's ever going to teach you. So, so you, you have to just forget that fear of being embarrassed or looking stupid. Ask the questions you'll be better off for it. The, the temporary embarrassment of asking what does the acronym RFI stand for is 
going to benefit you from then on once you know and can teach somebody else. Um, again, once you get into the more technical things of I, I, I've learned so much from talking to the foreman, talking to my subcontractors about like, hey, this RFI you sent me, I, I don't know anything about what you guys do. Teach me mm -hmm. so I understand this RFI. So whenever I submit it, I can talk to the architect intelligently. I, I, th I think that's so crucial because there's so many different types of buildings out there. There's so many different materials and situations you can encounter. No one person is going to know at all. You're going to have to learn from each other to, to be successful. Um, I would also say uh, be tech savvy. Um, I, again, I think just as the new generation comes in, you know, there's, there's some growing pains with an older, more traditional, more conservative and uh, general contracting industry. But there, there's a lot of data to crunch. There's a lot of insight to gain. Um, there's a lot of software tools. Um, uh, again, everybody's super hyped about AI. And, uh, you know, whoever figures out how to make that work could, could be incredibly successful. But I'm, I'm holding my breath on that. But I, I definitely think the technology and the tools the softwares are not, are not going away. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's really doing that much in paper. I haven't hand delivered a bit in a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think any, any employer you work for, you're probably putting your bids into Excel. So just being good at Excel is going to get you a lot of the way there. Yeah, no, that's fantastic advice. Cause that's how I learn everything. If if an RFI comes in, yeah. I don't even know what it says. I'm calling the PE and it's like, is this yeah. a question? What are they talking about? Explain these terms to me. Because mm -hmm. oh, for some things, I don't know how it's installed exactly or what they're looking at. Like I may understand the yeah. product and what the endpoint is and what's needed, but sometimes that installation questions, I need more information on. So. Mm -hmm. Never know. Anybody has questions. We're not perfect. Yep. Yeah, it's 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 incredible to think of how many people are involved cooperating to bring a building together. I mean, you know, the client is paying the architects. The architects are hiring teams of engineers and civil and structural subconsultants, MEPs, and then the general contractor and all the people in the field and all the subcontractors. It, it's, it's just amazing to witness how much cooperation happens, even if there is some competitiveness, even if there is some adversarial nature, because, you know, you're, you're talking about people's money and mm -hmm. people get very defensive about that. But at the end of the day, it's thousands of people all coming together to, create the built environment and maintain it yeah definitely but thank you so much jesse for being on to speak with me today if anybody has any questions for you or wants to learn more about estimating is there a good way to get a hold of you uh i guess you'd have to message me on linkedin <laughs> i don't have any other social media i deleted my facebook i never had twitter so i'm I'll put at least so, your LinkedIn down below. <laughs> yeah. I don't put yeah, emails, even if somebody does give yeah. an email, because you never know. Yeah, I, ch I check LinkedIn messages from time to time. Mostly it's headhunters. But, um, <laughs> you know, if there's somebody genuinely interested in, you know, talking to me about whatever, I'm, I'm more than happy to happy to oblige. I mean, I just love sharing my knowledge with with everybody out there. Yeah. Exactly. So I'll leave the link down below so they can find you yep. or headhunt you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for having yep. me. Thank you so much, Jesse. Yep. Take care. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. Learn some advice to take with you and see how our industry is all tied together to create the world around us. Check out the description below for any links or resources we discussed. If you liked the episode, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Give me a thumbs up and leave a comment below. It really helps others be able to discover this resource and support finding that career path that best works for them. If you know someone that has inspired your own career that you'd like me to interview, let me know in the comments below, or you can reach out to me via my website or LinkedIn. I'd be happy to share their story or your own. 
Thank you again, and I cannot wait for the next career story I get to share with you next week.